Hi, I'm Martin Kenny. I volunteer at the Old Low Light Heritage Centre and from where, prior to the lockdown, I would lead guided walks and give occasional talks. One of the talks I've given in the past was called Import-Export Traffic on the Tyne, which touched on the ship types visiting the Tyne and some of the problems associated with the different cargoes. This talk goes a little further by identifying some of the more unusual visitors to the Tyne. This table shows some of the information obtained from AIS, a ship's automatic identification system. Some of it's quite obvious, but some maybe not so. So reading across the top, we've got the call sign, which is allocated to a ship, to uniquely identify that vessel as opposed to several ships having the same name, primarily used for radio communication. The IMO number is allocated to a ship by IMO, the International Maritime Organization, through the SOLAS Convention, which stands for Safety of Life at Sea. It helps promote safety and combat maritime fraud. It consists of the three letters IMO, followed by size, seven numerals, and stays with the ship for life, irrespective of name change or owner. Then we've got MFSI, the Maritime Mobile Service Identity. It's a unique nine-digit number that's assigned to a digital selective calling radio, or an AIS, an automatic identification system. Gross tonnage has got nothing to do with weight. It's a measure of the internal volume of a ship, so it's a bit of a misnomer mostly used for passenger vessels and ferries. It indicates the size, really. Dead weight, the weight of cargo that a ship can carry in tons. It varies depending on the season of the year and the type of ship. And flag, the country of jurisdiction for that ship. And so we start on some of the more unusual ship types. Here's the ocean-going tug Centaurus, towing wind turbine jackets bound from Mulder's Yard, Wall's End, to a wind farm off the east coast of Scotland. This tug has a bollard pull of 104 tons. Designed to operate deep sea, in international waters, and sometimes used on standby in case of emergencies at sea. In 2011, the UK ceased to have an emergency towing vessel fleet. Bollard pull is a measure of the towing power of a vessel, similar to horsepower in a motor vehicle. It can be defined as the thrust of the propulsion system of a vessel when it has zero speed in the forward direction. In other words, just holding a vessel stationary against a strong wind. For example, a car carrier or ferry may have a windage area on one side of 2,080 square metres. A force 10 wind exerts approximately 50 kilograms per square metre. So on one side, 50 times 2,080 is 104,000 kilograms, or 104 tonnes. So this tug, the Centaurus, could just hold one of these vessels stationary in a force 10 wind. Bollard pull is found by connecting a bollard on the key to the tug, the engine is going ahead at full thrust and measuring the load force or tension in the tow line using a load cell. AHTS, anchor handling, towing and supply. You get a few of these in the river. The Star Hercules is shown here. She's been since decommissioned. These ships are used to lay anchors for oil rigs, tow oil rigs and barges, supply production platforms and rigs, and also in this case, fitted with a moon pool, a usually circular hole cut through the hull, to allow diving operations or the use of an ROV a remotely operated vehicle. This particular ship was chartered by Dr. Robert Ballard to search for and find the wreck of the German pocket battleship Bismarck in 1989. The Bourbon Dolphin, a short-lived vessel, she capsized on the 12th of April 2007 whilst running an anchor for an oil rig on the Rosebank oil field west of Shetland. She had 15 crew of which there were seven survivors. A much bigger bullet pull of 180 tonnes. She has thrusters, two stern thrusters, a bow thruster, an azimuth thruster forward, because these ships have to be extremely manoeuvrable when working in close proximity to a drilling rig or oil platform. This diagram is a different ship, but with the same configuration of propellers and thrusters. The Grand Canyon. She's a construction support ship, used to assist in the installation of offshore structures such as wind turbines. Recently, she was working off the northeast coast and is a regular visitor to Blythe. Wind turbine installation vessel, the MPI Discovery, MPI is the name of the company. This is a jack-up vessel so that in relatively shallow water, the six legs are lowered to the seabed and the whole ship is lifted out of the water. This provides a steady platform for the intricate job of placing the turbine and blades onto the steel tube tower. It has a maximum operating depth of 40 metres. Pipe laying and cable laying. This is the Aegea. She was working off the River Tyne in 2018. It looks a bit strange, the structures on deck. The crane has a maximum load capacity of 4,000 tonnes, and the two pipe reels, they're the orange things at the back, each have a capacity of 2,000 metres of 16-inch pipe. 
This vessel is fit of a J-laying, identified by the large red tower in the photo. S-laying is used in relatively shallow water, less than 150 metres depth, and the pipe has to bend twice, called contrafletcher, as it's lowered over the stern of the vessel to the seabed. This is an S-lay vessel sketch, and this is a J-lay vessel sketch. J-laying is used in deeper water and the pipe has to bend only once, thus reducing metal fatigue. It's lowered through the centre of the vessel via a moon pool. Here's the Seven Arctic, another J-layer, working off the tiny 2018 and now bound for Newcastle, Australia. Heavy lift ship. There are two or three types of heavy lift ships. One, those which ballast down to enable a ship or other floating structure to be floated aboard and lifted as deballasting takes place. Two, those which have cranes or derricks to allow the loading or discharging of heavy lifts independent of shore cranes. And three, those which are gearless and have the heavy lifts placed aboard and lifted off at the discharge port. As far as I know, the first ship, such as the Mighty Servant, shown here, has never visited the Tyne. These are usually large oil tankers which instead of being scrapped have been converted to this role. Here we have the UHL Focus, a visit at the Tyne. She's capable of loading and discharging independent of shore facilities. She has two heavy lift cranes which are certified and tested to a safe working load of 450 tonnes each, making a combined lifting power of 900 tonnes. Stability is critical in all of these vessels and frequently is pre-calculated by the ship's officer and then balance transfer and lift are controlled by a loading computer. But things do go wrong on occasion. HL Aura, another visitor at the time. This vessel falls into the third category. It has no cranes or derricks and is a gearless heavy load carrier. At the loading port, the lifts are placed on deck and may be welded to the deck or restrained in some serious manner before proceeding to sea. At discharge, which may be offshore, a heavy lift vessel or barge is required. We have the advantage over geared vessels that during loading and discharge, the centre of the gravity of the vessel is lower than a geared ship. This vessel and the UHL Focus are being utilised for the construction of the wind turbine farms off the east coast, carrying jackets, tripods, monopiles and blades. Dredger, UK Dredger Orca. This vessel is a suction hopper dredger whereby it trails a pipe load from one or two sides. The open-ended pipe is dragged across the riverbed whilst powerful jets of water loosen the sediment. The sediment is sucked up the pipe and discharged into a hopper for disposal later at a designated spoil ground at sea. The Orca has worked both the River Tyne and the River Blythe. And here we have a general cargo ship, the NV Dolphin. General cargo literally means anything apart from liquid substances. Before containerization, the majority of cargoes were carried in general cargo vessels. Today, general cargo ships tend to be small, unlike this example, designed for going up rivers and passing the low bridges. The masts fold down and the bridge structure is also lowered by hydraulics. Oil product tanker, the MV Fourth Fisher, MV just means motor vessel. Product tankers carry refined products such as petrol, diesel, lube oils, wax, bitumen, asphalt, usually to 150 to 160 Celsius, that's the bitumen. White spirit, aviation fuel, kero, naphtha. They vary in size up to about 60,000 tonnes dead weight. It's the smaller ones we see in the time. Note the crane amidships for handling the loading or discharging hose and the foremast which doubles as a vent when loading cargo. There's a walkway above the main deck known as a flying bridge to al allow access forward in heavy seas. Oil tankers are allowed to load deeper than other vessels because of their structural integrity and so there's a greater chance of heavy seas sweeping across the main deck. There's a free-fall lifeboat above the stern. Motor vessel Patara, a similar but larger vessel to the fourth fisher, where the added ability carries certain chemicals. The cargo tanks are specially coated or may be stainless steel to avoid corrosion from chemicals. LPG tanker, that means liquid petroleum gas, the motor vessel J.S. Lekvar. These vessels carry the gas in a liquid form, either as fully pressurised at ambient temperature, refrigerated at minus 150 Celsius, or a combination of both. LPG as a vapour occupies about 270 times the volume of the liquid state, so it makes sense to carry it as a liquid. This vessel is a frequent visitor to Teesport. Timber ship and the motor vessel Olive Bay, their bulk carriers are adapted to carry timber cargoes in the holes and on deck. Most timber is lighter than water and therefore floats. For this reason, ships carrying timber in bulk are allowed to load deeper due to the additional buoyancy provided. Light steel uprights are in place along the sides and an overall system of lashings to secure the cargo. 
The deck cranes are placed on high pedestals so that the jibs are clear of the timber. However, occasionally the lashings fail under extreme load. The timber shifts and problems with lists develop. Seen here off the ferry landing North Shields. That's about it. Hopefully the lockdown will be ended soon and we'll all be able to come back and visit the old low light and uh, maybe come on one or two of my walks. Thanks again. Bye. <laughs> Mm-hmm.